Google Earth is moving into the virtual world. Its 3D representations uh, are getting more and more accurate, and using SketchUp, they're allows, allowing user-driven material, such as this wonderful Golden Gate Bridge on my 1915 map of San Francisco, or going across the ocean to Beijing, looking at this 1830 map of Beijing. Someone has built a marvelous representation of Tiananmen Gate. Google Maps itself, as many of you know, has a very open API that has allowed data providers to use it as a kind of instant GIS. There's literally thousands now of uses of uh, Google Maps for all kinds of things. And I'm collaborating with a group, which I'll speak a little more about later, called GeoGarage, to put all of my 120 historical maps that are in Google Earth into Google Maps. It's not a trivial thing because working with these giant geotips and regenerating them in Google Maps is something that's difficult. In fact, Google hasn't even done it, but GeoGarage in France has, has figured out a way to do it. Map collecting itself is going through huge changes, I think. Um, I'm seeing the rise of digital map collectors, and I just want to mention the work of a friend, Map Fox. Matt is a uh, that works for the Environmental Protection Agency in Sacramento, and he's passionate about uh, making this Google Earth library of historical topographic maps. He downloads them from free sites, including my own, all over uh, the United States. And then he, his library creation is to build a KML index and visual display of how to find all the maps. He hosts this himself, and uh, it's been very popular uh, uh, with uh, historical map users. So I think this kind of thing is going to, to increase. Digital collecting of images and text, I think, will grow in the future as tools are developed to make it easier for people to do this. Here's his map of Pyramid Lake, near a place where I spent a lot of time in Nevada from 1894. We can look at the shoreline then and compare it with the Google Earth satellite image. The lake has shrunk. If any of you know Pyramid Lake, you know it's one of the big ecological issues of the area. The internet and the rise of broadband connections to it have had a major effect on the sharing of map data and increased access to mapping databases. Early on, we realized that if our goal with my map library online was to provide real access to the content and tools, we needed to get all of our content visible to internet search engines and other web indices, not just our site's homepage. So, we open the collection up to the search spiders and in various ways uh, today of the roughly 7,000 people a day who come to the site, 5,000 come to us via search databases where they find individual maps or groups of maps, not the home page. For example, looking at our basic record of the Chevalier map shown here of San Francisco, 1911-1915, this map appears in OCLC's WorldCat, we're a WorldCat terminal through the University of California, Berkeley. We've put now about 13,000 records. We've done original mark cataloging of maps that have never been cataloged before, and all of them linked to the electronic record. From OCLC, the records get downloaded into various uh, OPACs, Stanford and UC Berkeley, of course, and Harvard. And then, of course, the maps show, show up in Google, Google Images, in Yahoo, we contributed to the Geography Network. These are just a few of the places that we do these things. Geography Network shows it in ArcGIS Explorer. And of course, I mentioned we also put all of the maps into the ECI Clearinghouse database. The maps even show up in Flickr. People have built many collections out of my maps within Flickr uh, over the last year. And there's 43,228 external links to all of our content uh, that have been built up over the years, other websites, blogs, and more. A quick look at Google Analytics shows you our typical traffic pattern. This is October 30th of last year. We had 6,650 visits. The period of May 25 to November 28th of last year, 800,000 visits, they came from 216 countries, most of course from the United States, over half a million, but also from Brazil, under 5,000, Australia, about 11,000, even the Congo, 25,000, 25, 
visit. Sorry, uh, they came from 16,621 cities, including China, which sent about 2,000 visitors from 119 cities. The more that maps and other kinds of information databases are open to search engines, the more that can be made use of them. But I also think that one needs to open them up to other kinds of content as well. So I've done this over the past few years through visual collections, the site where you can combine cartography, fine arts, architecture, photography, and other images. These are all in the Luna application allows you to compare Japanese maps to my Western maps of Japan, to look at Japanese maps with art images from another database, and to look at text images here of the cursor letters from Chile with a map of Chile from my collection, and then art images from another collection. For our work, this is an example of a policy of openness that is realized through various kinds of site design considerations, software functions, and collaborative relationships. This is really how our library participates in the growing cyber infrastructure network for the humanities. My maps are viewed and downloaded by a wide variety of users, from scholars to homeschoolers to genealogists, historians, publishers, engineers, collectors, archaeologists, Wikipedians, and more and more, they're used in applications and sites that are often far removed from their original home. I think that librarians and libraries should focus on making their collections available to the widest community and let the community build tools and other uses of the content on top of that data. GeoGarage, as I mentioned earlier, is an example of my data being used in this way. Unknown to me, they harvested my, this huge 24 gigabyte image of France, which is free from my website. They built their own platform around it. They put it up as a demo. I got notice of it from a Google alert, found what they were doing, and now I'm collaborating with them. So making content available to be harvested by imaginative people is, is really critical, I think, for moving the agenda ahead. There's a growing community of software builders, both open source and large commercial platforms, like Google and other search engines, including asset actions that have been done here at DLF and many OAI-related projects. I think building software tools certainly can make sense for many libraries, but one, generally speaking, it's important not to forget that the time spent on doing the core work of digital conversion and metadata creation and creating tools that allow that content to be harvested and incorporated into multiple databases, this is important always trying not to lock the data up into closed silos of information. In this new space, then, a map is really not just a map. It's a digital, in its digital form, it can carry so many identities. First, I'll, I'll show two examples of this. Looking at Henry Popple's map here from 1733, we can look at it in a QuickTime VR of my library, pan around the quick time and we see the actual atlas lying on the floor of the library. We can click on that in quick time and it opens in the Luna database. We can then see its representation in Luna, which is very fact, factual, uh, faithful to the original. See the 20 sheets of the atlas. See the composite I made of all 20 sheets joined digitally. And zoom in and then do a mashup with the view that's in the upper left corner, other maps of New York City from different time periods, charts, area maps, modern charts, and views. And then we can move into a global context, seeing that same digital image now in Art Globe. We have a whole other perception of it. We can use transparency to see how it relates to the modern satellite view. And as we zoom into the cartouche here, we're now more in a virtual world where we're flying over the map. We're not limited to panning and zooming. We move across Central America and Florida, up to East Coast of the United States. One can get a real sense of travel, moving across the Great Lakes through the quite fantastical way that Popple mapped the sources of the Mississippi River 
highly inaccurate and interesting. And then down the river, over ancient St. Louis, to the Delta and New Orleans, and then sort of rocket-like, we, we move up, twist the map around to where we began. And then, of course, that same process now, that was all desktop, can be done in Google Earth. 